Hey, thanks for checking out my video. Chris here from the YouTube channel Sabrosa. Today I was out doing some hiking and some urban foraging. I was looking for some nettles to make some tincture. I, I found I found the nettles for my tincture, but I also came across some wild mushrooms today, and um, and these are actually uh, these are actually an edible mushroom. So I I brought with me on my hike today this book that I picked up at Powell's bookstore last week. This is called A Simple Guide to Common Mushrooms, Mushrooms of the Northwest. And and they make these for different regions. I have a friend and he has one for the for the Midwest and and they make different editions. This is the 2019 edition. Um, this book was uh, $16.95. It's really fantastic the way it's laid out and shows you like cap and stem with gills. And then as you as you flip through it'll say cap and stem with pores and then it'll tell you what the toxic mushrooms look like. But at any rate, I came across these oyster mushrooms today. And I'll just read to you uh, I'll just read to you from the book here. Two oyster mushroom species in our area are now considered variations of the classic oyster mushroom, which is a European species that does grow in parts of the United States, but apparently not in our area. All are fragrant and choice edibles that are easy to identify. Oyster mushrooms are saprobes that hasten decomposition of the wood which they grow. So these these guys were growing in clusters and they were and they were they were growing on a dead tree, which I believe might be a birch tree, but I'm not positive. So the habitat oyster mushrooms always grow from wood and are found on living trees, dying trees, or dead trees, stumps, and logs. They may also grow on buried roots, appearing to grow from the soil. Oyster, oyster mushrooms are shelf-like, typically growing in overlapping clusters on living and dead wood. And so you can see that, that these are shelf-like, where they, where they sit out like a shelf and um, they're usually overlapping clusters and that's that's where i found them was on a was on a fallen tree so the caps are fan shaped or semi-circular if growing against a standing tree trunk but maybe circular if the specimen is growing upright from a fallen log or from buried roots edges are often wavy scalloped or irregular the cap is smooth and hairless above and is fairly meaty especially where the stem and cap, the stem and cap meet Stems may be short or stubby or virtually non-existent when present and not covered with any gills. They are usually downy near the base. They are attached at the cap at one side or off center and there is no ring. So as you, as you look at the stem of the mushroom, there's no ring where the, where the cap separates itself. Or maybe a, a better example would be this one. There's no, there's no ring on the stem. These are different characteristics to help identify mushrooms. Gills are closely spaced and run down the stem, or may simply taper down to a stem-like stub. So when we look at when we look at that, we can see that's exactly what they're talking about, where the where the gills run all the way down the stem. Fresh specimens have an anise-like odor. The oyster mushrooms discussed here are similar in so many ways that it may be difficult to determine exactly which species you have found. Below are some traits that may be helpful. Microscopic examination is necessary for absolute certainty. Happily, they are all edible, so exact species identification is not required when collecting for the table. So, and here it talks about pale oyster mushrooms, also refer referred to as, as summer oysters. So the pale oyster has caps that may be whitish, ivory-colored, tan, or peakish brown. Individual caps are typically less than three and a half inches wide, they may be more oblong or lung-shaped than caps of the other oysters. Gills are white, becoming cream-colored with age. Pale oysters are most common on the wood of coniferous trees, but may also be found on hardwoods. They are present from late spring through late summer and are often found at mid-level elevations. So we were, we were up pretty... Not not super, you know, not on a tall mountain, but we were up on a on a butte, so it would have been like a mid-level elevation. Um, and then down here, it talks about spore prints, white to buff-colored spores of pale oyster may have a lilac or warm gray tinge that is lacking in spores of the aspen oyster. So, 
and that the season for these is late spring through late fall, depending on the species. And and we're at about we're at about mid spring to late spring right now. So I'm I'm hopeful that I'll be able to find some more of these. Um, but this is a really fantastic book, and and I would definitely recommend checking that out. So I'm gonna go ahead and do two spore prints with with this um, with this batch of mushrooms here. And I think it'll be curious to see this this um, gray purple color that they talked about. Um, talked about the the pale um, oyster mushrooms having. So to do this spore print, I did it. I did this spore print directly on top of a microscope slide. So I've got my microscope, and I'm going to give this one about about 24 to 48 hours. I like to do a longer spore print. And and then I'll just use a I'll use a marker and I'll write on the slide the 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 genus and and the date and and I like to keep some slides of different different wild mushrooms that I find and and I'll also be doing a another spore print on and on a piece of black paper so it talks about the spores being kind of light colored and so so I think the best way to do that would be the black piece of paper so I've got this this is probably the only button shaped one besides besides the one on the slide there that I found today so I think this one's probably going to make the best print so I'm gonna take my scissors and just cut this guy as flush as I can with the cap there we go and then I'm just going to set this set this cap upside down on a piece of black paper and you'll notice that I've got this sitting on kind of a dish here and this is a lid for my jar and this is a, this is a concept I came up with when I was reading about how to do spore prints it, it talked about using a jar to um, to keep any any breeze from uh, disturbing the the print of the spore print and so what I what I decided I would do would be take my piece of paper and put it in the lid of a jar and then I'll just take my jar Screw it on there. It doesn't have to be tight. You can, you could actually leave it loose so it can breathe a little bit. And um, and and then I'll just set this on a shelf upside down like this for 24 to 48 hours, and then I will have my spore print. And uh, that'll be really, that'll be really fascinating to um, to see that. So yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of fun. It's it's really great to, it's really great to get out there and do some urban foraging and. Um, and it's like you never know what you find, so I, I like to carry a couple of guidebooks like this with me of different, you know, different Northwest plants and, and, and their medicinal properties. And so thanks for taking the time to check out my video. Uh, if you got any ideas about, if you got any ideas about new videos, or if you uh, want to leave me a comment and, and uh, talk about some of the mushrooms that you've been finding or your experience with these mushrooms, that'd be really great. Uh, if you want to like, share, and subscribe, that'd be really great too. I got a lot of great content that I'm working on and lots of stuff coming up. And I've got a lot of stuff on my channel already too. So uh, thanks again for watching. LVX.